Thank you for joining us with these podcasts. They are designed to challenge us in the Christian faith. We hope that they do that for you. And we also hope that sometime you will join us at First Christian Church in Malvern. May God bless you. We are, uh, we are looking in Exodus chapter 7, and we'll be looking at, uh, uh, let's look at verse 13. And uh, in this particular thing, what had happened prior to that, was uh, the rod had become a serpent, and uh, now uh, they were unaffected by that. So now in verse 4, 13, it says, Yet Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not listen to them, as the Lord had said. Then the Lord, or Jehovah, said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is stubborn. He refuses to let his people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is going down to the water and station yourself to meet him on the bank of the Nile. And you shall take in your hand the staff that was turned into a serpent. And you shall say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to you, saying, Let my people go. For they may serve me, that they may serve me in the wilderness. Behold, you have not listened until now. Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. Jehovah, I am. Behold, I will strike the water that is in the Nile with the staff that is in my hand. And it shall be turned to blood. And the fish that are in the Nile will die. And the Nile will become foul. And the Egyptians will find uh, difficulty in drinking water from the Nile. Then the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Take your staff. Stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt. Over the rivers over their streams, over their pools, and all of the reservoirs of water, that they may become blood. And there shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, uh, both in vessels of wood and vessels of stone. So Moses and Aaron did, even as the Lord had commanded, and he lifted up the staff and struck the water that was in the Nile in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants. And all the water that was in the Nile was turned to blood. And the fish that were in the Nile died. And the Nile became foul so that the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile. And the blood was through the land of Egypt. But the magicians of Egypt did the same with their secret arts. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not listen to them, as the Lord had said. Then Pharaoh turned and went into his house with no concern even for this. So all the Egyptians dug around the Nile for water to drink, for they could not drink of the water of the Nile. And seven days passed after the Lord had struck the Nile. Okay, we're going to take a look at this. Uh, first of all, what does God strike? The water. The water. The water of the Nile. And it affects the rivers. It affects the streams. I mean, it's not just the Nile in itself. Uh, it, it's interesting, all the waters there, the rivers, streams, their pools, their reservoirs of water, uh, and it becomes blood. Now that's, that's kind of an interesting thing that it becomes blood. Why do you think it became, I mean, why didn't it become algae? <laughs> you know? 
boom, all the water became algae. Why does it become blood? God's trying to make a serious point here. Yeah. Yeah, life is in the blood. And he, through that life, that blood, he kills the Nile. And, and so what happens to the fish? They die. They die. Yeah, they don't do so well in blood. <laughs> Your boys probably never tried that in their goldfish bowl. Uh, <laughs> Putting blood in it. And <laughs> no, no, just the vacuum cleaner. Yeah. <laughs> just that. Yeah. Well, you know, what's kind of interesting, and what happens when fish die? They stink. Oh, it stinks. We used to go to Canada, and up in the fishing where you clean the fish, oh, it stink. Uh, I'll never forget, uh, I owned a pond and uh, had fish in it. And I bought those bottom eaters, you know, the algae eaters, and, the, and just got a bunch of them. And uh, algae was starting up, so I heard that cop uh, copper sulfate's good to kill that. So it's, it's May, it's early May, and so I put copper sulfate in it. And the next day, uh, our bathroom was facing the uh, pond. Carol goes, Mark, I said, what? Our fish are dead. I said, no, it can't. They're not dead. I see fins. And I said, no, it's probably leaves. And so I go out there, and they were dead. Now, the bad thing was, our neighbors, th that property used to belong to their brother. And they used the pond for their source of water. And I've got all these dead fish in there. And the minute I saw it, I said, okay, Carol, come on. And we get the paddle boats, and I had a canoe, and we're throwing these dead fish in the boat. And I'm trying to bury them before the remains really stink and before they notice that the water is no good. <laughs> and we, we cleaned that all up. We got them all buried and everything. And uh, <clears throat> it was a mess. It was a real mess. Uh, we also had uh, turtles in there. And I'll never forget, we caught a turtle one time. And I told Melody, pull it up, pull it up. Well, she was in her flip-flops. And she's got this string trying to pull it up, and she's afraid it's going to bite her feet. So the string breaks. So I thought, well, that's the end of that. We'll have to find the turtle another way. Well, here the turtle wrapped the string around the bottom where the pipe came in where my neighbor got his water <laughs> and wrapped and died because he couldn't get to the sur surface. Oh, he dropped the turtle right where his water comes in. Oh, good, I never know. You're such a good neighbor. I know. I think that pond was cursed. <laughs> I think so. So I was glad when we got rid of the pond. But you can imagine what it would have been like for all these fish to die and it's blood. I mean, blood smells anyway. I mean, really. If, if, if uh, blood is left, you can, you can smell it. Uh, and then fish on top of that. So what happens to the water uh, in the wood and stone vessels? Yeah. Now, the, the author of uh, the information that I'm giving you has said that wood and stone vessels were used in the religious ceremonies of the... Uh, Egyptians, and so God was striking their religious ceremonies with that, and that, that's quite possible. That's yeah. Well, now, what did the Egyptian magicians do? They did the same thing. Yeah, through their magic arts, through their, I call it satanic arts, but uh, 
But what did they not do? And you might have to think a little bit on that one. They didn't reverse it. Isn't that interesting? Through all of these things that happen, they can imitate or do that, but they can't reverse it. I mean, why didn't Pharaoh go to his magicians and say, reverse it? It never happens because God is God. And what he does, he does. They've never reversed any of these miracles. They always, Pharaoh ends up either waiting for the time allotted for it to be done or going to uh, Moses and saying, stop it, please stop it. Uh, now, in the end times, I'm going to go clear to the book of Revelation. What is Satan going to do? Yeah, in fact, we're going to see some comparisons with the judgment that God is giving upon Egypt with the judgments that God is going to give in the tribulation time to the world. Isn't that the second judgment? There's, there's, yeah, there's blood that he turns, yes. Now... I gave you a worksheet a second, uh, which is on the, the back of the last page. And I want you to notice that during the second, you were right, the second trumpet, it is second. Yep, there is a judgment, and two witnesses bring blood. In fact, when we look at this, we're going to see some parallels, now not in the same order or anything like that, but we will see some parallels in the book of Revelation with the end time that we see here happening to Egypt. And it's because God is giving a judgment against Egypt. In the end times, God gives a judgment against the world. So... I know. <laughs> we're, we're learning. Uh, we're actually going to start the book of Revelation. <laughs> I have been doing the end times, and I don't know how many lessons I had prior to Revelation. Yeah, something like that. But we're actually going to be starting uh, the book of Revelation this Sunday. Uh, but if you look at that, there was a warning, right? It was copied by the magicians but in the connection with the tribulation we see that in the second trumpet judgment and the two witnesses bring blood now what's interesting about this the egyptians had close to 80 gods i always thought that that was strange that must be you know they there must be weak gods to have that many gods for every little area. Our God is God of all. He, he, he's in control of all things. But their gods might just be of the Nile. Or water. Or rain. Or crop, another God for crops. Another God for this. Another God for that. They had one for crocodiles? Yes. Yes. They had a, 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 a crocodile god. Did you see that there? They got a river, uh, Nile River god. And I don't know how to pronounce these gods. I'll be honest with you. Uh, I have a hard enough time just with English. But uh, he's, they've got this river god. He's the guardian of the Nile. And happy spirit of the Nile. Osiris. Uh, I don't know. Is that Sepek? crocodile god neath Hathor. So you got all of these gods that are watching over the water and the Nile and the crocodiles. 
And uh, you stop and think about that. I bet you the crocodiles crawled out. You know? But, so this judgment is to show that God is supreme. Because one God, the Almighty God, is doing all of these judgments to show that he is far superior to the many gods of Egypt. So, let's go back to our sheet of uh, things here. Uh, we see how it mocked those gods of Egypt. And uh, God is doing this for another reason. Remember we had said that the Israelites for 400 years or so have not really heard from God. They have just worshipped him and they just knew about God because of their oral traditions. Now they're seeing the power of God being demonstrated. And so this is for them as well to see that power. Uh, you know, God had only worked uh, this way four times in history. This one right here with Moses where he did all of these miracles and, and signs and wonders. Elijah did a lot, didn't he? Um, Elisha also did a lot. Jesus did a lot. And we're going to see in the tribulation time there will be judgments that God is going to pronounce. So, you, we see those four times, and then really the fifth being in the, the tribulation. All right, let's, let's take a look at chapter 8, and I'll read 1 through 15. Then Jehovah, Yahweh, said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says Yahweh, the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite your whole territory with frogs. And the Nile will swarm with frogs, which will come up. And go into your house and into your bedroom and on your bed, and into the houses of your servants, and on your people, and into your ovens, woo fried frog legs, <laughs> and into your kneading bowls. So the frogs will come up on you and your people and all your servants. Then the Lord, or Je uh, Jehovah, Yahweh, said to Moses, Say to Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff, over the rivers, over the streams, over the pools, and make frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did the same with their secret arts, making frogs come up on the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may remove the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go that they may sacrifice to the Lord. And Moses said to Pharaoh, The honor is yours to tell me. When shall I entreat for you and your servants and your people that the frogs be destroyed from you and your houses? that they may be left only in the Nile. And he said, tomorrow. So he said, may it be according to your word that you may know that there is no one like the Lord your God. And the frogs will depart from you and your houses and your servants and on your people and they will be left only in the Nile. Then Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moses cried to the Lord concerning the frogs which he had inflicted upon Pharaoh. 
And the Lord did according to the word of Moses. And the frogs died out of the houses, the courts, and the fields. So they piled them in heaps. And the land became foul. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and did not listen to them as the Lord said. Now this is the judgment of frogs. Now, the magicians copy this, don't they? Let me ask you, did they get rid of the frogs? No. So, why did Pharaoh go to Moses to stop the frogs? He knew they were the only ones that could stop it because God is God. Yeah, he, he's the only one that can stop it because God is God. Uh, why not his magicians? They couldn't do it. So, if you look at the worksheet again, on the back of that, you'll see frogs. Now, there was a warning, but the magicians copied it. Now, it's interesting that in Revelation 16, 13, it records a release of frog-like demons. And that's kind of an interesting thing in, in the book of tribulation time. But there was a frog god. In fact, I don't know what happened, but when I first taught this, I had a whole uh, PowerPoint presentation and what these gods looked like. This was a god that had the head of a frog on it. And... Uh, the Nile Hopi, the, the, the Nile fraternity God associated with the arrival of frogs. Now, as a kid, I used to love the arrival of frogs. You know? You know what that's like? Now, most of you are girls, but as boys, we go down to the pond and we see these tadpoles. Yeah, and we watch them start to change. And they get little legs that come out and they little feet, and then at night you can hear them croaking. And we had a, we had a uh, pool at my grandparents' house that my dad had built, it was cement, and we had a pond. Well, they would come from the pond during the early spring and get in the pool. And th we had to shovel the pool out with leaves that had gotten in, because it was a big pool, we didn't have anything to cover it back then. But those little tadpoles would also get in there, and you'd see these frogs coming out. As a kid, I loved it. I remember uh, uh, one of the preachers was preaching about the frogs at a youth rally I was at when I was a youth minister, and his little son was sitting there, and he was talking about frogs covered everything, and the little boy went, yeah! <laughs> he was excited about the frogs covering everything. But it was very annoying. It really was. It was very annoying for them. Because imagine getting in bed and there's frogs. Okay? Or you go to eat and there's a frog on your plate. Well, didn't the, didn't the Egyptians make it worse? Yeah. I mean, they made it worse. They multiplied them so yeah. know, they would uh, change their mind about trying to do yeah. things. Yeah. But they couldn't reverse it, could they? They had to go to Moses and say, will you do this? Will you, will you get rid of, of these frogs? So, so you've got the fertility god with the head of a frog and a body of a woman. They had some strange gods. Okay? And I don't know how you get a fertility uh, god out of a frog, but... They did. And uh, it's probably because they had a lot of frogs in Egypt. So when you, when you look at that, to show that God is in control, what does Moses ask Pharaoh in verse 9 and 10? He gives him a choice of when the yeah. plague can end. And he said, tomorrow. Yeah, ima I said right now. Yeah. Imagine... Imagine that God has honored 
Moses so much that he would allow him to go and ask Pharaoh, tell me when. Now that's talking of confidence that Moses has in God. Because see, Moses is learning also in the power of God. So he goes to Pharaoh. He says, when do you want him to get rid of him? You name the date. Well, he says, tomorrow. Okay. And it happened. So I always thought that was an interesting concept. Uh, what does verse 13 seem like it should be God telling Moses? Yeah. Here's Moses telling God when it's going to be. And it seems like God should be the one telling Moses. But you notice God works with us, doesn't he? When we by faith work with him. And so God is working with Moses. What happens to the frogs? They don't. Yes. They stink. Dead frogs stink. Yeah, not in the river. Yeah, there's some that are in the I river. That was interesting too, right? Yeah, there's this distinction. So they add to the fish stink. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you had the the stink of the fish, the stink of the of the blood, and now imagine trying to clean up your vessels with that blood that had been in it. No water to clean. Yeah, no water to clean had to dig to filter water close to the Nile. And that, that's what that really means. You know, if you're survival camping and you need water, you may go to a sandy place and dig near a river and that water will be filtered, you hope. <laughs> okay. Till you find out it wasn't and you're running to the bathroom. Uh, so now in verse 16, we, we get to another part in 16 through um, uh, 19 here. And it says, then the Lord, or once again, he's revealing his name. I, I know I keep saying Jehovah Yahweh, but I only do that to get across the point that God, when you say in the name of someone, it's the power that stands behind the character of God. And so the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah, says to Moses, Say to Aaron, strike out your staff, stretch out your staff, strike the dust of the earth, that it may become gnats through all the land of Egypt. And they did so. And Aaron stretched out his hand with the staff and struck the dust of the earth, and there were gnats on man and beast. All the dust of the earth became gnats through all the land of Egypt. And the magicians tried with their secret arts to bring forth gnats, but they could not. So there were gnats on man and beasts. Then the magicians said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had said. Now, imagine there's a lot of dust, isn't there, in this world? And imagine being in a place like Egypt, and the dust, Becoming gnats. Now, I don't like gnats. <laughs> Do you ever walk through a swarm of them? We, we were camping and, and Madison's going, look, Papa. And there was these gnats. And she says, I'm afraid. And I said, don't be afraid. They're just gnats. But let's not walk through them, okay? <laughs> so, they're just Annoying gnats are. It seems like whenever you get a cantaloupe that, that produces gnats. Or a banana. Or a banana. Yeah, well, they or. Get, they fly up your nose and Yes! Or banana oh, that's bread. Disgusting. 
Oh, I know. Keep your mouth closed because don't inhale through your mouth. So, yeah. So, there we have these, these gnats. Revelation uh, 11, uh, 6 is the closest parallel to gnats and, and the earth. If you look, it's called uh, swarms. And uh, even though you'll notice that there's uh, footnotes usually in your Bible about gnats because we don't know exactly what that Hebrew word was. We had to kind of go to Egypt and see what they had in order to understand what that Hebrew word really was. But uh, in, in Revelation 11.6, all the plagues were released by the witnesses. Swarms. Swarms. And uh, did you know there's God of the protecting, the protector of swarming insects? Yes, yes. And uh, Seb, protector from lice. Now, that's kind of an interesting thing. And protector of lice. That's what my Bible calls it. Lice. lice. Yeah, yeah. And we're taking a guess at some of these Hebrew words because uh, we don't know exactly some of that vocabulary of that ancient Hebrew language. Uh, but when you look at it, the question comes, could the magicians copy this plague? No. No. There was and, no warning on this one. No, there wasn't. Boom. He just struck it and it happened. Now, you know what's interesting is some uh, commentaries have made a, a, a progression of things saying, yeah, you got blood, you got uh, the, the dead frogs, you got... Uh, All, all of this produces these swarms of insects or lice or... Now what's interesting is this plague, and it's kind of important, is a mockery of the Egyptian priests. Now, the priests would shave their bodies so that no insects would be on their bodies. Well, what happens to these swarms? They're all over man and beast and I always think of the poor horses you know we, you have to really protect horses from swarms of things but uh, so if you look on the sheet of the swarms there's no warning and it's not copied and uh, you, you get this God the protector from lice that they pray that they don't get lice. Well, forget that. These, these are lice and swarms and gnats and insects. Okay, so we, we see that uh, in 20 through 32, and I'll read that, uh, chapter 8, and I'll start with 20. And it says, now the Lord, or Jehovah, Yahweh, said to Moses, rise early in the morning and present yourself before Pharaoh as he comes out to the water. Man, this guy took a lot of baths. Uh, but whatever, he comes out to the water and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. For if you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of insects on you and on your servants and on your people and on your houses and on the houses of the Egyptians shall be full swarms of insects and also on the ground in which they dwell. And on that day I will set apart the land of Goshen where my people are living. Did you get this? On that day I will set apart the land of Goshen where my people are living so that no swarms of insects will be there in order that you may know that I, the Lord, am in the midst of the land. 
and I will put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign will occur. And the Lord did so. And there came great swarms of insects into the house of Pharaoh. I kind of got ahead of myself a while back when I was talking about the swarms. But, and, and the houses of his servants and the land was laid waste because of a swarm of insects in all the land. And Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Go sacrifice to your God within the land. But Moses said, It is not right to do so, for we shall sacrifice to the Lord our God what is an abomination to the Egyptians. If we sacrifice what is an abomination to the Egyptians before their eyes, Will they not stone us? We must go a three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he commands us. And Pharaoh said, I will let you go that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only you shall not go very far. Make supplication for me. Then Moses said, Behold, I am going out from you, and I shall make supplication to the Lord that the swarms of insects may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants, from the people tomorrow. Only do not let Pharaoh deal deceitfully again in not letting the people go to sacrifice the Lord. So Moses went out from Pharaoh and made supplication to the Lord. And the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah, did as Moses asked and removed the swarms of insects from Pharaoh, from his servants, from the people. Not one remained. But Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also and did not let the people go. Now, that, this is kind of an interesting thing here. Uh, in, in this particular passage of Scripture, the, what happens to, uh, to Pharaoh? I mean... What does he willing to compromise a little bit here? What does he say at first? Okay, can you sacrifice yeah, I'll, I'll let you go and sacrifice, but I'm not letting you out of the country. I'm not allowing you to go three days journey into the wilderness. That's outside the country. You have to do it inside. Now, what happens... What does Moses say? Nope. Nope. And Moses gives a, a different reason. Because the Egyptian people would, would stone him. Yeah. Because they were killing sheep. Yeah. The reason would be they worshipped cattle. That was part of their God. They worshipped cattle and they worshipped some sheep you know the Romans used to take the guts out of sheep and that they would tell the future through that whether they should go to battle or not but the the Egyptians would be really offended that you're killing an object that they worshipped, like a bull. Because they worshipped the bull. So, they're upset about that. And, uh, so it says, Moses says, we, we got to go three days journey. We must go three days journey. What does Pharaoh say?
Yeah. But then in verse 28, he says, uh, the Lord God in the wilderness, only don't go very far. But what's he ask? Pray for me. Pray for me. That's all. Yeah, that is. Pray for me, he said. Now that's, that's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, so we, we find, uh, by the way, they also have this dog flies. You see that there? Mm -hmm. The dog flies. I guess they are terrible dog flies. And uh, they, they live in Egypt. It's, it's bad. It's bad. But did you know that they had Beelzebub, which is God of the flies? And they actually, it has a face of a fly on it. Satan represented himself as Beelzebub, God of the flies. I think that's, that's something. Well, now Pharaoh hardens his heart. But, but Moses gave a warning. What did he give this warning to Pharaoh about? Verse 29 at the end. Have you ever noticed in scripture how angry God gets at deception? when we try to deceive him. That's an important thing I think that we need to take note of. Look at uh, uh, Ananias and Sapphira who said they gave all of the money at the apostles' feet. The husband was struck down. The wife comes later. So what, they ask, what was your agreement? She deceived, she lies, she's struck down. Moses is giving him a warning. Don't be deceitful to God, to Jehovah God. That is a good thing for us to take note of. Because sometimes in our lives, we can deceive ourselves and in doing so deceive God. Or we can think that we can hide a sin from God that we do. God is not deceived. He knows. He is the God of everything. And so Moses gives this warning to uh, to Pharaoh but Pharaoh hardens his heart and so in the ninth chapter and by the way your your charts say one it's real hard to translate these words properly that's why some will say gnats some will say dog flies. Some will say swarms. The gnats are swarms. Mine said swarms here when it's really dog flies. Uh, it depends on the version Bible you have and what they think that Hebrew word is. It's very hard to, to identify that exactly. So we come to the ninth chapter. And then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and speak to him. Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews. Let my people go that they may serve me. I want to stop here. I, I, 
I know I should have, I, I don't like to stop, but I need to stop. How important is it that we serve God? Stop and think about that. Yeah. To be a servant. I didn't know that until I was 12 or 14 years old, and I had a, a great Sunday school teacher, and she um, told me about it and, you know, taught me. And then I learned that I had to be a servant like he was That's to right. him and to others. I mean, this is so important, serving, that look what God is doing so that the people will serve him. I mean, service is a big deal to God. He wants them to serve. Yeah, he's going to free them. And too many times we look at this story as only a story of freeing the people. But what are they freeing them to do? To serve. And so this whole idea of service is very, very, very important to God. So, I'm sorry. I want to point that out, verse 1. Verse 2. For if you refuse to let them go and continue to hold them, behold, the hand of the Lord will come with a very severe pestilence on your livestock, which are in the field, and on the horses, on the donkeys, on the camels, on the herds, on the flocks. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, so that nothing will die of all that belongs to the son of Israel. And the Lord set a definite time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land. So the Lord did this thing on the morrow, and all the livestock of Egypt died. But the livestock of the sons of Israel, not one died. And Pharaoh sent, and behold, there were not even one of the livestock of Israel dead, but the heart of Pharaoh was hardened. And he did not let the people go. So, in this one, if we look at our chart under pestilence, what is pestilence? Disease. Disease. Can be a pandemic, couldn't it? COVID-19. Uh-huh. <laughs> it could be a pandemic. It could be whatever. But pestilence... Now, Moses warns that this is going to happen. It's not copied. The magicians don't copy that. And if you read the fourth seal, judgment, there's going to be pestilence in the last days. And you'll see that with the two witnesses. But what's interesting about this is the Egyptians had a god that took care of bulls. It was a sacred bull. It was kept in the open. Uh, Apus bull. Uh, Menevis, sacred bull of Ra. Hathor, cow goddess. Gnome, ram-like god. And they were gods that took care of the livestock. How well did they take care of the livestock? Not very, well. Not very well. They died. And so we see here that Moses warns them, but he still, they won't listen. So 
Here we go. Whoops. I better see if there's questions there. I think I'm catching these questions. Am I, am I not? Yes. Okay. Uh, once again, God spares the uh, Israelites. But God shows mercy to the Egyptians. How does he do that? Trick question. I don't know how he does it. He does it. <laughs> he just does it because he's God. In the tribulation time, the evangelists, the two witnesses, the 144,000 evangelists are sealed. They are spared the plagues that God gives the land. There is a seal of God on their forehead. Now, I'm not talking about the 666 seal of Satan, but I'm talking about God separates. And he protects them and he blesses them. Yeah, that, that has happened in the past. It happened right here in Exodus. And uh, so it's, it's, it's interesting to notice. I'm going to read on a little bit here uh, about the boils. Anybody ever have a boil? Aren't they fun? No, I had a boil. It was on my bottom. I couldn't sit. <laughs> it was bad. Went to the doctor. We'll have to open it up. I go, no. You know, boils are terrible. So what happens here in verse 8, and we'll read through there. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, take for yourselves handfuls of soot from a kiln. What's a kiln? Yeah. Oh, like that. What else would they make in a kiln? Furnace. Bricks. 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 Yeah. That they used to build. <laughs> Bricks that maybe the Israelites were using? Mm -hmm. Their dishes and stuff too, probably. Yeah, and I would say it's all the bricks that had to be made, there were a lot of kilns. But let me read this. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take for yourselves handfuls of soot from a kiln. Let Moses throw it toward the sky in the sight of Pharaoh, and it will become fine dust all over the land of Egypt and will become boils, breaking out with sores on man and beasts through all the land of Egypt. And they took soot from a kiln and stood before Pharaoh, and Moses threw it towards the sky, and it became boils, breaking out, with sores on man and beast. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils. For the boils were on the magicians as well as on the, uh, all the Egyptians, on the, magi on the magicians as well as all of the uh, Egyptians. And the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he did not listen to them just as the Lord had spoken to Mo Moses. And then the Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning, stand before Pharaoh, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. For this time I will send all my plagues on you and your servants and your people, that you will know that there is no one like me in all the earth. For if by now I've put forth my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, you would have been cut off of the earth. But indeed, for this cause, I have allowed you to remain in order to show you my power and in order to proclaim my name through all the earth. Still you exalt yourself against my people by not letting them go. Wow. Wow. And if you look at, at the boils on that number six, the, the, they're, uh, 
boom. It's the in the in the tribulation time. It's the first uh, judgment. And guess what? There was a God over epidemics. No. And a God of healing. <laughs> yes, and a God of medicine. But you know what? They could not protect these people. So I wanted to, to mention that. So, and this, this particular thing just happened. Boom. It, there was no, I mean, Moses is there and he throws it and, and uh, he, he, in the sight of Pharaoh, but it's not a warning. It's, it's done. It's a done deal. So, all right, we are, we are in six plagues. We will cover some more. Uh, any questions? Just a comment. Don't you think that they would take heed to what is happening? Yeah. Really? Yeah. And we're going to get into, some say it could have been over right there, mm -hmm. that, that Pharaoh was ready, but... We're going to see that God's going to harden Pharaoh's heart. And there's a reason for that. God wants to teach more about himself to the Israelites as well as to the Egyptians. And we will see that by the time they leave Egypt, the Egyptians are giving them things away. Get out of here. Take this. Take this gold. Take this silver. And it's all the plan that God has to enrich his people. So, yeah. That, that's where I, I'm in. I'm in um, Deuteronomy, but at home. But um, I was reading about that where um, they gave all the jewels and the gold and the silver and stuff like that, but didn't they use all that for the tabernacle and for yes. the, um, clothes that the priest had to wear? And, and, and there's, a, there's a real lesson in that, too. I mean, that, that people gave it to them, and they give it to God. Yeah. Before, I never figured out. I, I just couldn't figure out where they got the stuff from. But How then, could these slaves have this? Back, yeah. Yeah, and got it and understood it more. Right. Yeah, that was cool. Okay, people. Thank you for joining us with these podcasts. They are designed to challenge us in the Christian faith. We hope that they do that for you. And we also hope that sometime you will join us at First Christian Church in Malvern. May God bless you.